Charles Ogletree. I'm the Jesse Klinko Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School and also the founder and executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. As I said before, I really apologize that I won't be able to join you today. But I wanted to uh, say this, I'm going out to uh, a Harvard Law School alumni event uh, in Texas and will be there for a couple of days. Let me uh, first salute uh, Judge George uh, Layton. Uh, he is, in a sense, a remarkable man for all that he's done in his life. Born on October 22nd, 1912, uh, he's already 100 years old and he will be uh, 101 uh, in a couple of weeks uh, from now. Uh, he has been a remarkable person, uh, growing up uh, in, uh, in New England, uh, had this great experience in New Bedford. His families are, uh, family are Native members uh, from uh, Cape Verde's. Uh, and I think the reality is that he has, in a sense, turned what seemed like an unlikely opportunity at educational success until, uh, until a glamorous uh, educational success. Uh, he went to school as a young man, uh, never went to high school, uh, and yet uh, he was able to contact uh, the dean and go to Howard University. He graduated from Howard as a student there, met magna cum laude, and he also uh, was able to uh, use that to launch it by contacting the dean here at Harvard Law School and come to Harvard Law School. Uh, he was a stellar student here at Harvard Law School, very active in a lot of information, uh, very well known to his colleagues, uh, and has lived a, a rich and wonderful life. When you think about his uh, accomplishments, they are impossible to list. He served as a judge uh, in Illinois. He's admitted to the Illinois Bar, he's admitted to the Massachusetts Bar, he's been a judge here, he's a federal, he serves as a federal judge as well, and he's also been very active in law firm, uh, law firm life, he's also been uh, an incredible successful lawyer in representing people with a host of legal issues that they've uh, encountered. Uh, and we salute him today uh, as really one of the great geniuses. Uh, and he, George Layton, uh, congratulations, we celebrate your greatness. And we're so happy to present you today with this wonderful award in the name of Charles Hamilton Houston because it reflects he uh, being active in this in the 20th century. You have continued that work in the, 20th, in the 21st century. Congratulations and best wishes. And I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing our dean, my dean, here at Harvard Law School, Martha Minow. Martha is an incredible force of nature. Uh, she's been involved in law and in education. She's written numerous books, uh, and she is a well-known ac academic as well as an advocate for justice and equality. She has sort of reshaped what we do here at Harvard Law School, and for that we're grateful. But she was one of the amazing people, and you'll hear more about it today, who had the great opportunity to clerk for Thurgood Marshall uh, when he was on the Supreme Court, and she was his law clerk. Uh, she helped write opinions, do research, and learned a lot about him. Her and Elena Kagan and so many other people from Harvard Law School and other law schools were uh, Marshall clerks uh, and still uh, have that uh, Marshall perspective in what they do. Uh, as busy as she is, she's still writing, uh, she's still teaching, she's still out talking to young people about coming to Harvard Law School. Uh, she comes to our events whenever she can. Uh, and to say uh, how important she was, she was just, uh, in a sense, the host and one of the keynote speakers uh, and one of the conveners for an event celebrating my colleague and office mate, uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz, who just uh, decided to retire after 50 years of teaching uh, at his, uh, after his 75th birthday uh, and will continue to write uh, and uh, be a senior member of the faculty, an emeritus member of the faculty would make a big difference. But this is a sense that we need to recognize Dean Minow for what she's done. She comes from a family of leaders, uh, her father, uh, her sister, uh, everybody has made a big impact on justice and equality in America. And we're very happy and very pleased and very honored to have her as our Dean, uh, the person who leads Harvard Law School well into the 21st century. I want you to join me in please welcoming my Dean, our Dean, the Dean of Harvard Law School, Martha so Minow. What Professor Ogletree didn't say in his wonderful introduction, um, but I want to emphasize, is that between 1946 and when he became a judge in 1964, Judge Layton represented individuals who were denied due process, who were denied fairness in the criminal justice system over and over and over again. He represented plaintiffs and defendants he represented people in 200 criminal trials. 
He represented people in 175 appeals and reviews. And in these cases, he made history. The most famous, maybe, of his cases was the case of Earl Howard Pugh, who spent 17 years in prison before he was discharged. And the Illinois legislature passed a bill authorizing payment for the wrongful incarceration, all because of Judge Layton. Uh, he represented uh, another man in the case of Lloyd Elton Miller versus Pate, in which the death sentence, death sentence was imposed, and it was set aside by the federal district court um, because of the work of Judge Layton. Case after case after case, which would have been wrongful, wrongful actions as it was often uh, late in the lives of people, but it, Judge Layton is the man who stood up for justice. And that's in, in addition to all of his work on behalf of the NAACP uh, in the Illinois chapter. And rightly, he was recognized and became a judge, uh, both a state court judge, a federal court judge, and Illinois has named uh, its criminal courthouse for him. Uh, and as Charles Ogletree said, his own personal qualities and his stamina and his tenacity are the reason why he got an education in the first place. Uh, he had to leave school due to family needs. He entered a contest and he won a paper writing contest. And it was on that basis that he wrote to the dean at Howard University and said, you think maybe I could get admitted? He's admitted first as a special student, only later admitted full time, and, and graduates magna cum laude. Distinguished, distinguished graduate of the Harvard Law School, Judge Layton represents what a pursuit of justice looks like in a, in a lifetime. And we are honored, truly honored by his presence. Judge Layton, we, we are honored to recognize you and commend you for your extraordinary contributions to justice. I would like all of you to know that my being here this afternoon is a return of the native. In 1940, I hitchhiked part of the way from Washington, D.C. to talk with Jane McCauley Landis, who was then dean of the Harvard Law School, about my desire to be a student in Harvard Law School. In fact, when I first thought of the idea, I didn't quite know where Harvard Law School was. <laughs> but a few days after that letter to the dean, I received one hand-scrawled note that said, when you are next in Cambridge, stop in and see me, Landis. Well, I didn't know Dean Landis, and I believed that he didn't know me, but I was mistaken, because he and Jane McCauley, or William Haynes, rather, had, who was then Dean of Howard Law School, had been students together at Harvard Law School and had worked in the law review together. He got from Dean Haynes a brief description of why I was saying that I wanted to be a student in Harvard Law School. I hitchhiked part of the way to Cambridge, called his office early in the morning. His secretary told me the dean will see you if you'll come right over. So in a few moments later, I was in the dean's office, then Langdell Hall. I realized that was my one chance to become a student in Harvard Law School. First place, I hadn't, didn't have the money. Second, I didn't have uh, influence or family. My mother and father were immigrants from the Cape Verde Islands, didn't speak English. I spent all of my boyhood days working on cranberry bogs, strawberry patches, blueberry bushes. Never went to school. So when I walked into the room, I got an inspiration just to tell them about my mother and father and what had happened to me. I want you to understand that Dean Landis didn't say anything to me. He didn't ask me any question. Uh, he didn't prod me about my uh, ambition. He didn't say anything about how silly it was to think, think to come to a school that required money for tuition and uh, overcome those difficulties. 
When I had run out of words, I paused, and he was then looking at me, nodding his head in that little room in Langdale Hall. He said simply, he said, when you get through at Howard, you come to Harvard Law School. Just like that. He didn't say, I'm going to give you a scholarship or I'm going to give you uh, an entry into the class or anything. I picked up my things and thanked him, left, and then learned that he had admitted me to the first year class of the class of 43. And I was to start day after Labor Day or so that year. Well, I did. And then came World War II, as you know, right in the middle of the uh, class of 1943, three-year term. I was sent to the Pacific Theater, rose to the rank of captain, was discharged with honors, came back, right back here, not very far from where I'm sitting and re-entered in what they call the accelerated program. That is, they told us, if you come back so fit as to be able to study, you may take part in the accelerated program, which will do two years of law studies in one. I accepted it. In addition to that, I uh, took the bar examination in June 1946 uh, in Massachusetts. Passed before I had my last lecture in the law at the law school. Then began this glorious session in Chicago. You might ask, why, why would you go to Chicago? Why Chicago? You were born in New Bedford, Massachusetts? Well, I learned something about Chicago that most people didn't know. Chicago in 1946 was the only city in America that had a black face in Congress. His name was William L. Dawson. Somehow it convinced me that for a city to be riddled with racism, race discrimination, yet overcome them and send one of their number to Congress, that was the place for me. Now tell me, what is the relevancy between having a black face in Congress and success in the practice of law? Well, it turned out that I made it, made it representing poor people most of the time. Most of my clients didn't have a defense and didn't have money to pay a fee. But I made it because of the place that Chicago is. I was successful. People of Chicago elected me to public office. I became a judge in the Circuit Court of Cook County, then became an appellate court justice served four years in that office. And then of all things, Gerald Ford, a Republican, I, a Democratic Party liberal, was selected to be the judge of the United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois, a lifetime judgeship. I took it. The scuttlebutt was that when I got to the examination day, I was going to be flooded with attacks by people who didn't want any person like me on the bench. But when I got in the room with Charles Percy and the others who were supporting me, there was no one present. That afternoon, I took a plane back to Chicago. I was a lifetime United States District Judge. And I served until August 1984. I retired. I'm now a, re a, a retiree from the bench. And I also retired from uh, practicing law for the simple reason that uh, there comes a time, as you can see how hard a, a time I had getting on this chair, well, it takes a good deal of effort uh, to do that. But I want to thank uh, Jim Lopes and all of you who had a hand in my being invited here, and Dean Mano, and I want to thank all of you who have made it possible for me to be here come back to Harvard Law School after all of these <laughs> years, practicing law, judging cases, writing opinions, deciding matters on the merits and, and, and legal issues involved. It is a great experience, a great background. But I owe it all to that remark of Jane McCauley Landis, who said to me, when you finish Howard, you come to Harvard Law School. 
Thank you very much.